This week, we're exploring the mystery of the Maya pyramids. The Maya were the greatest pyramid builders of the ancient world. The Egyptians built fewer than a hundred. The Maya built thousands. Every Maya town and city had its own pyramid. Why? Could it be the pyramid of one great Maya king holds the key? We're about to find out. He made his journey into the underworld. Right, this is the entrance or the exit. Our quest will take us deep into the mountains and jungles of Central America. Hold on to your hats, it's going to be one wild ride. I'll be whitewater kayaking on remote mountain rivers in Guatemala and diving into the flooded underground caves of Mexico. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Ready for the plunge? Ready for the plunge, baby. Pyramids. The ancient Maya built thousands of these amazing structures all over Central America. We know the pyramids were the center of Maya life, but what we don't know is why. To find out, we're going to visit one of the greatest Maya pyramids ever built and learn about the extraordinary man who created it, King Pakal the Great. Our quest will start in the city Pakal built in southern Mexico, Palenque. And I've got a lot of airports to get through on the way. There's a new one, in case I lose the old one. How many bags do you get in Pakal in Mexico? One bag. Coming through. Four people, four flights, 17 bags. I'm excited. I want to see. I want to see every room. I want to see the tomb of inscriptions. I want to see all the palaces at Palenque. I have some questions. I definitely would like to get answers to. But to be uh, 10 miles away, it's uh, like this is a journey of a lifetime. Tomorrow morning, I'm finally going to explore the place I've been waiting to get to all these years, Palenque. It's dawn, and the jungle is coming alive. And everywhere are the most amazing ruins. Fourteen hundred years ago, the city's most famous ruler, Pakal the Great, built the most beautiful temples the Mayan world has ever seen. From 632 to 683 AD, while Europe was still in the Dark Ages, the Maya world was flourishing, and Pakal was creating this great city. They say he was a ruthless warlord, but he must have been a great architect, too. Even in ruins, his city is incredibly impressive. As I walk around the ancient palace, I try to imagine what this city was like in Pakal's day. The crowds of Maya warriors, the traders, and the nobles he would have seen as he walked around Palenque back in the seventh century. Pakal planned the entire city, but he saved his greatest creation for last. The astonishing pyramid built to commemorate his own death, the Temple of the Inscriptions. It's the biggest tomb created for a single man anywhere in the ancient Americas. I've come here to meet Mexican archaeologist Alfonso Morales, who's a well-known expert on Pakal. Alfonso? Hi, I'm Josh. Look here. Mucho gusto. As we climb the 69 steps of Pakal's tomb, Alfonso explains to me that when Pakal built this pyramid, he believed he was building a sacred mountain. You're trying to build a mountain, he said? Mm-hmm. Well, why build a mountain here, though, and there's, and there's a mountain right there? I think he wanted to create his own cave to put his tomb inside. His own cave? The caves are normally a place where you go to the underworld, when you can talk to the gods, and the place where you start your trip to the other world. 
So there's a cave inside here? Yes, to understand it, we need to go inside and take a look at it. An artificial mountain with a cave in it, an entry to the underworld. Were these somehow the keys to Pakal's pyramid? Fortunately, there are hieroglyphs that tell Pakal's story. And when archaeologists finally broke the Maya code, they read of a strange underworld journey that Pakal's spirit would take after his death. It started from a cave in a mountain. And this is it. Yes, this is the most sacred place at Palenque. The entrance to the underworld. I will go down to Pakal's tomb. Lead the way. The stairway seems to go down into the blackness forever. It's narrow and steep, and the limestone steps are slick with condensation. It would be all too easy to slip, and it's a long, long way to the bottom. It really feels like I'm going down into the underworld. And Alfonso tells me the Maya were obsessed with the underworld. It was their gateway to immortality. Pakal believed that after he died, he'd journey for two and a half years, meeting the gods and demons of creation along the way. He was sure he'd finally be reborn as a god himself. Finally, we get to the bottom of the stairway and find the tomb. So this is it. This is his cave. This is the famous cave of Bagani. And there's the sarcophagus. Amazing. And from here, he made his journey into the underworld. Right, this is the entrance, or the exit to the underworld. Depending how you look at it. Yeah. And his body is here. His soul or his spirit is already gone to the other side of the, the cave. Two and a half years after he was placed here. It's beautiful. Cave of Bacal. In the mountain of Bacal. Exactly. On the sarcophagus lid is a great carving of Pakal frozen in the moment of his death falling into the cave of the underworld as he starts his journey. And then Alfonso gives me the most intriguing piece of the puzzle about Bacal's pyramid. The Maya believed that his spirit would be carried from his sacred mountain cave by a river. Bacal's journey to the afterlife was a journey down a subterranean river. But there's no river at Palenque. Alfonso tells me this was a river in the spirit world, but that it was modeled on a real underground river elsewhere. In the cave, a place where the water comes out. The Yucatan contains the world's largest system of natural wells and underground rivers. There are over a thousand wells and hundreds of miles of water-filled tunnels running beneath the limestone surface of the peninsula. They're called cenotes, and there's nothing like them anywhere else on the planet. I've got a hunch that Pakal's concept of the underworld might have been modeled on these real subterranean rivers. I'm not gonna pass up the chance to explore these cenotes for myself. So I've teamed up with famous cenote diver Pablo Diaz, who's going to be my guide. The underwater world of the cenotes is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. The water is 75 degrees and crystal clear. There are stalactites everywhere. And beyond them, tunnels and caves stretch away in every direction into the blackness.
Only about a third of the huge cenote system has ever been explored. That's because it's so dangerous. Many experienced divers have drowned in these flooded tunnels. Since I don't want to be one of them, Pablo and I swim back towards the cenote entrance by a different route. The network of tunnels seems to be endless, and away from the light, they all look the same. I can see how easy it would be to get lost down here. The experience of the cenotes is eerie and awe-inspiring. This is stunning. The second you dive in, you're transported to another world. Clearly, the Maya did not have scuba gear. But even if one just held their breath and dove into the cenotes and saw these caverns and the caves behind them and the tubes that interconnect them, there's something, there's something there. There's a sense of being transported to another place. To investigate Maya beliefs about the cenotes further, I've come to the Maya city of Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. Chichen Itza flourished between the 8th and 12th centuries. It sits squarely on top of the cenote system, and I've heard it was an important ritual center. I'm on my way to meet archaeologist Rafael Cobos, who I hope can tell me more. Rafael? Hi. Mucho gusto. I'm Josh. Welcome. What was it about Chichen Itza that was so important? At uh, Chichen Itza, we have the sacred cenote. Why was the cenote considered sacred? It's the entrance to the underworld. Uh, pilgrims came during pre-Hispanic times from all over the Yucatan Peninsula. For the pilgrims, that was the entrance to Xibalba, the underworld. Wow. This is the sacred cenote. That's right. This is the entrance to Xibalba. That's beautiful. The great cenote is stunning. But how do we know it was an entrance to Xibalba, the Maya underworld? It seems that from the time of the Spanish conquest of the Americas in the 16th century, Stories had circulated of strange blood rituals performed here in which children were sacrificed to the gods of the underworld. To see if these stories were true, one of the very first archaeologists of the Maya, Edward Thompson, decided to dredge the cenote in 1904. He found lots of evidence of ritual offerings. At first, it was only objects, figures of gold and jade. But eventually, he found shocking confirmation of the old stories about the cenote, human bones, lots of them. The Maya of Chichen Itza were performing human sacrifices, offering their victims to the gods of Xibalba. So the priests would actually throw bodies into the cenote? That's right. Where? Where would they do it? From that temple, located on the southern edge. The gruesome ceremonies at the Great Cenote are more evidence the Maya really did believe cenotes were entrances to the underworld, where the gods and demons of creation lived. But are these the actual subterranean rivers Pakal believed he would travel down after death? Now I really want to explore them more. Where are we off to? Uh, this uh, site is called Temple of Doom. Really? I'm hot on the trail of the secrets of Maya pyramids. At the ruins of Palenque, I discovered that King Pakal believed his pyramid was a symbolic entrance to the Maya underworld. That led me to explore the stunning subterranean caves and rivers called cenotes, which the Maya believed were the real entrances to the underworld. I understood that there's a parallel between the pyramids and mountains, but I had no idea that the caves 
were so important. And going into Pakal's tomb, I got a sense of this whole building was made just for this cave. And then to find out that the cave was only an access point to the rivers, and then the journey through the cenotes, uh, just the, my whole concept of the Maya religion exploded. The tourist beaches of the Yucatan Peninsula may seem like a strange place to search for the secrets of Pakal's passage to the afterlife. But beneath these beaches are the points where the freshwater cenote system meets the sea. One of them is the cenote they call the Temple of Doom. I'm hoping my guide, Pablo Diaz, and equally famous cave diver, Gonzalo Arcila, can tell me more. I was wondering, I've heard that there are these tubes that go from the cenote bottoms all the way into the sea. Yeah. And I was curious, if one, if there's one around here that we could explore, and two, if I could actually make that journey through the tube. It's not a pretty dive, and it's a technical dive. I, I understand it's, it might not be pretty, but I guess what I want to what I want to explore is why the Maya thought this was a passage to the underworld, and, and I'm hoping that even if I can't see anything, seeing nothing would still be valuable because it would give me some insights into what that journey was like. How dangerous is it? When the fresh friend? water meets the salt water, that the, the the visibility becomes completely blurred, and and it just becomes very eerie and. It really takes your breath away for a minute. It's uh, quite a trip. So I guess I, what I don't understand is the risks. We consider it dangerous. The, the cave splits in several directions, and one mistake will lead to a very dramatic ending we don't want to have. I'd be stuck, basically, Yeah. Once if in a hole, it. and I couldn't get out. So I would just stay there until I ran out of air? Yes. Yeah, I don't want that either. <laughs> I've got a hunch that the passage from fresh water to salt water may be the key to the Maya underworld. I'm determined to experience it, but first I need specialized training from Pablo. Learning to cave dive is all about learning to maneuver underwater in the dark. I put on a mask blacked out with tape. Pablo spins me around to disorient me. Then, in total blackness, I have to secure my line and then find the lifeline that would guide me out of the cave. Without being able to see, it's a real challenge. On a lot of dives, finding that line would be the difference between life and death. It's so beautiful down there. That was a great job. How did you feel doing this tour? That was fine. Yeah. That was fine. Went right to the rope, right? Yeah. You did a great job. Thank you. Okay. Let's go for a dive. Finally, the moment has come for my dive to the sea. We'll see if I live. But I, if, if it works, I come through, and as I come up, I'm a god. At that point, I'm officially reborn as a god, and the crew is aware of that. My accommodations will be upgraded significantly. I'm on my way to the cenote called the Temple of Doom and the point where fresh water and salt water meet. Divers call it the Halocline. And I've heard a theory that the Maya believed the Halocline was the meeting point between this world and the next. Could this possibly be true? And uh, we'll go to the Halocline. When we go to the Halocline, that's the transition to the salt water. Mm -hmm. Remember, visibility will be lost. And it's like a big psychedelic blur. This is a cenote. This is stunning. Imagine walking in the jungle and suddenly finding out this. One short leap in. I say, let's go for it. Pablo explains that at the Temple of Doom, there's a constant flow of water to and from the sea. The cenote system is like a giant lung, 
which breathes in salt water from the sea at high tides and exhales it at low tides. We hope the halocline is not too far away. Ready for the plunge? Ready for the plunge, baby. <laughs> Below the surface, tunnels extend for miles. We swim into the darkness. Fifteen minutes in and still no sign of the halocline. It's much farther away than we'd hoped deep inside the dangerous blackness. We swim on. The stop sign is a warning. Beyond this, there are no lifelines. We're in unchartered territory. We're heading into the Maya underworld of the dead. Finally, we see the halocline. It's astonishing. An invisible barrier throwing everything out of focus. A shimmering wall of water. And then suddenly, we're through into the crystal clear salt water of the sea. Could the Maya possibly have experienced this phenomenon? Perhaps some sacrificial victim survived to tell the tale. We'll never know, but it's an intriguing possibility. The Halocline is the perfect image of the meeting of two worlds. The subterranean rivers of the Maya underworld are an unforgettable experience, but I still have a lot to find out about Bacal and his temple. So two planes and six hours later, we've made it to Guatemala City, and the adventure continues. On the next leg of my journey, I join a magical ritual of the living Maya and risk my life again on a wild ride in Guatemalan whitewater. My investigation of Maya pyramids is turning into a real detective story. In my own way, I've been following the clues for days now. In Mexico, at Pacal's tomb in Palenque, I discovered a set of mysterious images, a passage to the underworld, mountains with caves and rivers inside them. These are the images which seem to have inspired Pacal's pyramid. But where do they come from? In the Yucatan, I discovered subterranean rivers and the extraordinary halocline, the underground meeting point of fresh and salt water, the perfect image of a portal to the underworld. But what about the mountains and the caves? Right With archaeologist Rafael Cobos at Chichen Itza, I try to connect the dots. The creation is the creation myth, also known in the Maya as the Popol Vuh. The Popol Vuh says that bodies of water and temples, mountains, are always related with the underworld. Rafael tells me the Popol Vuh is the Maya book of Genesis and one of the very few Maya texts to survive the Spanish conquest. For centuries, the Maya had carefully written down the stories of how their gods created the world. But in the 16th century, Spanish conquerors declared Maya religion to be the work of the devil and set out to destroy it. Priests consigned thousands of priceless Maya texts, the heart of Maya religion, to the bonfires of the Inquisition. Only a handful survived. 
One was the Puffle Fu. It was discovered in the highlands of Guatemala, in the town of Chichicastenango. Since it sounds like the Puffle Vu might have the answers I'm looking for, that's where I'm headed next. In Chichen Itza, I learned that a lot of the answers to my questions about the Maya pyramids might be found in a mysterious Mayan document called the Popol Vu. That's why I've come to Chichi Castanango in the highlands of Guatemala. This is where they found the Popol Vu and where I can uncover some of its secrets. Chichi Castanango is the heart of the living Maya world and the heart of the living Maya religion. I think there's someone here who can help me understand the Popol Vu. His name is Benicio Pena, and he's been living with the Maya in the highlands for years. Benicio? Yeah? Hey, how are you? Benicio. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. This place is amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Let me show you around. Yeah. Okay, hey, vamos. I've never seen so much color in my life, or so much religious devotion. Benicio knows more about the Maya religion than anyone in Chichicastenango today. Inside the church, signs of Maya worship and offerings are everywhere. We have corn, we have avocados, we have prunes and incense. Yeah, actually it was hidden right behind the main altar. That's what they found. It. Really? That, that was at the beginning of the 18th century in 1701. It seems we owe its survival to a Maya priest who was determined to preserve this priceless Maya knowledge for future generations. Taught to read and write by missionaries, he secretly wrote the story down. He hid it behind this altar where it stayed for 150 years. What did we was hidden away from the from the conquistadores? Really? Because the conquistadores did destroy. Its discovery opened a window into the heart of Maya belief, which today has been blended with Christianity to create a unique religion. Benicio. Teach me about the Popol Vuh. Okay, uh, the Popol Vuh is like the myth of the Genesis, the Maya Bible. That's, okay. uh, that's what it was said. It's about the origins, the beginning, the beginning of time, and the creation of mankind. Is there anything in the Popol Vuh that relates the Mayan beliefs of the underworld with caves and rivers? Oh, yes. Yeah. Benicio tells me the Popol Vuh is the story of the gods who created the world. Two of them, the hero twins, descend into the underworld and discover the secrets of eternal life. The first parts were, I mean, the proper book talks about it. I mean, the, the hero twins, Hunahpu and Ishbalanke, going into the underworld, but the way they go is through a sacred mountain and a sacred cave, and then to a river. To Could this be the key I've been looking for? Benicio says that there's something he wants to show me at the ruins of Utatlan, a Maya city just outside of town. Benicio, this place is beautiful, but how does it relate to the sacred caves that we're talking about? The Mayans still use it today to perform ceremonies. And they've been tunneling right under this temple to make ceremonies. So they're actually digging under this site and right praying? Under this side, yes. Is that something I could see? Yeah, let's go and see. I'll show you. Lead the way. It seems that for centuries, the Maya have been digging an artificial cave beneath the city's ruins. It's a sacred site where they conduct ceremonies all the time. There's one in progress when we arrive. A shaman friend of Benicio's is starting a ceremony just outside the mouth of the cave. He's asking for the blessing of the Maya gods. So he starts a ceremony here? Yes. He begins here before he can go in inside. He has to ask permission to the guardian spirit of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So he can go in and do a ceremony inside. Does he do the same ceremony inside? It's different because basically inside they just offer incense and candles. Finally, 
the moment arrives for the shaman and his wife to go into the sacred cave. It's extraordinary. A tunnel at least 100 yards long stretching deep beneath the ancient city. If ever there was an entrance to the underworld, this is it. In silence, we follow them in. I'm struck by the beauty of the sacred space the Maya have created. For 500 years, they've kept their beliefs alive here. It occurs to me they've recreated the cave of the Popol Vuh, the cave where the world was born, and they're still worshiping in it today. As we leave the cave, another question occurs to me. Here and at Palenque, we have a cave in a mountain. In the Yucatan, we have underground rivers. Is there a place where all three exist together, a cave and a river in a mountain? Yeah, the Mayans believe there is a place in the high jungles of Guatemala, we call it Candelaria. It's a real place? Yeah. Really? You've got to take me there. OK, okay. let's go. <laughs> this is turning into an epic adventure, and there's more to come. We're heading for Guatemala's high jungle. My goal is the hidden spiritual birthplace of the Maya world, where I hope to finally discover the secrets of Maya pyramids. But the journey's going to be a wild one. What I've found out so far about Maya pyramids is just amazing. In their pyramids, the Maya were recreating mountains with caves and rivers in them, entrances to the underworld. In Chichicastenango, in the Guatemalan highlands, I finally found out why. The Maya Book of Genesis, the Popol Vuh, tells how the world was born from a cave and river in a mountain. In the ritual at the man-made cave outside Chichicastenango, I realized that for millennia, wherever they could, the Maya have sought to recreate that sacred space. Even more amazing, I've discovered that the sacred mountain, cave, and river of the Popol Vuh were based on a real place, Candelaria. To see this cave and to see a prayer happening there and to understand that this cave is built on the model of a real cave, which is not far from here, that makes me want to get there like now. The highlands are laced with rivers, and one of them is taking us down into the high jungle. The caves of Candelaria are our goal. But first, we're going to visit the Maya ruins of Canquen, the only Maya city with no pyramid. Paradoxically, it may hold the key to all Maya pyramids. I'm excited because Canquen is the site of one of the most famous Maya archaeologists alive today, Arthur Demarest. While Benicio plans our next river trip, I go in search of Arthur. They call him the Indiana Jones of Maya archaeology. I'm told Arthur has uncovered entire Maya cities, faced down tomb robbers, and received countless death threats, many at gunpoint. Yeah, you must be Josh. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, hi. Nice to meet you. I'm supposed to, I got to get a photo. I'm supposed to look like him. Every time they come, they're disappointed. I'm sorry. I, I do what I can. Uh, Arthur is eccentric, brilliant, and he talks nonstop. And they're going to start making all my colleagues do it, mm -hmm. and my colleagues are going to hate me. But, but he probably knows more about pyramids and Maya kings than anybody alive. Because I'm going to forget. Um, and As I walk around the city with Arthur, I'm struck by something. There are palaces, but no pyramids. 
Kangquen was a spiritual power center, but there are no temples or pyramids. Why? Well, everything about the place can be explained in terms of the fact that there are no temples here. The core of every Maya site is this collection of temples. Maybe they've got natural temples, the real wheats. And these are the temples of the site. Wheats means a sacred hill with a cave in it. We are at the base of the highlands here, where the Chinaha Mountains slam into the rainforest. I mean, it is a boom, just like that. And the rivers that are coming off the highlands, because these are very soft limestone mountains, they don't go over, they go through, and they come shooting out. We have them all over here. So this site doesn't need temples. They got the real thing. So, so you're saying that the people of Cancun didn't need to build temples because they already had them here. Yes, they had them. And, and they're it? much better. The ones that God makes are much better. I mean, these things are awesome. So that explains everything about this site. Okay. Because the temples here, they're caves, and you go explore them. You find the stuff from Conquen, the offerings. You find that's where they're doing their religion. Is there any reason for these caves to be considered a path to the underworld? Yes. Here, that's important here as well. Oh no, that that, that it comes from here. There are um, 39 kilometers of caves. There are nine places, nine, like the nine levels of the underworld, where the river comes out of the wheats, out of the mountain, and comes out and then goes back in. So not just in terms of local religion, but in terms of the kings in the north, they knew too, these guys got the real wheats. So this, and was, they would this, come. this was a spiritual power center. Oh yeah, there's more ceramics from Palenque here than any other place except Palenque. And do you know how far away Palenque is? It's a long way. Yeah, in the Maya world, that's China. This is the so people were coming here from all over the Maya world, including Palenque, to worship. It's even possible that Pakal was one of them. This is final confirmation that I'm on the right track. Candelaria seems to be the spiritual birthplace of the whole Maya world. And it's not far off. And then, Benicio and I see the wheats, the perfect pyramid-shaped limestone mountains Arthur was talking about. There are lots of them. Now we both just want to get to the river, which will take us there. As soon as we're in our kayaks, we discover another of the amazing features of this landscape Arthur told us about. The whole river gushes out of one hole in the rock. It's astonishing. From here, it's downstream to the Candelaria Caves. but we have one last hurdle to clear. The water may look gentle now, but between us and the caves are deadly rapids. Time to get our helmets on and lash our gear tightly to the kayaks. My trip to the Maya underworld is about to get very interesting. This water is shooting down into the jungle from the highlands. As the water roars around the huge boulders and bends in the river, it creates treacherous whirlpools. Getting caught in one could be dangerous, even fatal. The river is full of massive boulders, both above and below the water. That's me clinging to my kayak after flipping over. Luckily, I'm able to climb back in and continue. It's a harrowing ride, but Benicio and I make it through the rapids with only a few scrapes and bruises. More of the pyramid-shaped mountains called wheats tell us we're getting very close.
On our final approach to the caves, the water calms down. I'm about to see the place I've been searching for all this time. So the cave that Benicio has been taking me to is just around the corner here. And I'm excited because it's been a long journey through both the Yucatan and Guatemala. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just want to get there and see what it looks like. Wow. This is amazing. The cave is even more spectacular than I imagined. It's all here, the cave and the river in the heart of the mountain. The entrance to Shibalba. This is the river Pakal thought his soul would travel down when he died, leading him towards the Maya afterlife and his rebirth as a god. Finally, I'm in the sacred place Pakal was trying to recreate in his great pyramid at Palenque. My quest to discover why Pakal built his pyramid has come full circle. It all started right here at Palenque. Now I really understand why Pakal's tomb, in fact, every Maya pyramid, is a mountain with a cave and a river inside it. No wonder the ancient Maya were the greatest pyramid builders in the world. For every one pyramid the Egyptians built, the Maya built 10. Every Maya town and city had its pyramid, and every one of them was designed to bring people close to the mountain, the cave, and the river where the world was born. like them anywhere else on the planet. I've got a hunch that Pakal's concept of the underworld might have been modeled on these real subterranean rivers. I'm not gonna pass up the chance to explore these cenotes for myself, so I've teamed up with famous cenote diver Pablo Diaz, who's gonna be my guide. The underwater world of the cenotes is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. The water is 75 degrees and crystal clear. There are stalactites everywhere. And beyond them, tunnels and caves stretch away in every direction into the blackness. Only about a third of the huge cenote system has ever been explored. That's because it's so dangerous. Many experienced divers have drowned in these flooded tunnels. Since I don't want to be one of them, Pablo and I swim back towards the cenote entrance by a different route.
the net to Shibalba. This is the river Pakal thought his soul would travel down when he died, leading him towards the Maya afterlife and his rebirth as a god. Finally, I'm in the sacred place Pakal was trying to recreate in his great pyramid at Palenque. My quest to discover why Pakal built his pyramid has come full circle. It all started right here at Palenque. Now I really understand why Pakal's tomb, in fact, every Maya pyramid, is a mountain with a cave and a river inside it. No wonder the ancient Maya were the greatest pyramid builders in the world. Or the exit to the other world. Depending how you look at it. Yeah. And his body is here. His soul or his spirit is already gone to the other side of the, the cave. Two and a half years after he was placed here. This beautiful cave of Bacal. In the mountain of Bacal. Exactly. On the sarcophagus lid is a great carving of Pakal frozen in the moment of his death falling into the cave of the underworld as he starts his journey. And then Alfonso gives me the most intriguing piece of the puzzle about Pakal's pyramid. The Maya believed that his spirit would be carried from his sacred mountain cave by a river. Pakal's journey to the afterlife was a journey down a subterranean river. But there's no river at Palenque. Alfonso tells me this was a river in the spirit world, but that it was modeled on a real underground river elsewhere. A place where the water comes out. The Yucatan contains the world's largest system of as the water roars around the huge boulders and bends in the river, it creates treacherous whirlpools. Getting caught in one could be dangerous, even fatal. The river is full of massive boulders, both above and below the water. That's me clinging to my kayak after flipping over. Luckily, I'm able to climb back in and continue. It's a harrowing ride, but Benicio and I make it through the rapids with only a few scrapes and bruises. More of the pyramid-shaped mountains called wheats tell us we're getting very close. On our final approach to the caves, the water calms down. I'm about to see the place I've been searching for all this time. So the cave that Benicio has been taking me to is just around the corner here. And I'm excited because it's been a long journey through both the Yucatan and Guatemala. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just want to get there and see what it looks like. Learning to cave dive is all about learning to maneuver underwater in the dark. I put on a mask blacked out with tape. Pablo spins me around to disorient me. Then, in total blackness, I have to secure my line 
and then find the lifeline that would guide me out of the cave. Without being able to see, it's a real challenge. On a lot of dives, finding that line would be the difference between life and death. It's so beautiful down there. That was a great job. How did you feel doing this tour? That was fine. Yeah. That was fine. Just went right to the rope, right? Yeah. You did a great job. Thank you. Okay. Let's go for a dive. Finally, the moment has come for my dive to the sea. We'll see if I live. But I, if, if it works, I come through, and as I come up, I'm a god. At that point, I'm officially reborn. As Escape Arthur told us about. The whole river gushes out of one hole in the rock. It's astonishing. From here, it's downstream to the Candelaria Caves. But we have one last hurdle to clear. The water may look gentle now, but between us and the caves are deadly rapids. Time to get our helmets on and lash our gear tightly to the kayaks. My trip to the Maya underworld is about to get very interesting. This water is shooting down into the jungle from the highlands. As the water roars around the huge boulders and bends in the river, it creates treacherous whirlpools. Getting caught in one could be dangerous, even fatal. The river is full of massive boulders, both above and below the water. Finally, we see the hollow climb. It's astonishing. An invisible barrier throwing everything out of focus. A shimmering wall of water. And then suddenly, we're through into the crystal clear salt water of the sea. Could the Maya possibly have experienced this phenomenon? Perhaps some sacrificial victim survived to tell the tale. We'll never know, but it's an intriguing possibility. The Halocline is the perfect image of the meeting of two worlds. The subterranean rivers of the Maya underworld are an unforgettable experience, but I still have a lot to find out about Pakal and his temple. So two planes and six hours later, we've made it to Guatemala City and the adventure continues. On the next leg of here than any other place except Palenque. And do you know how far away Palenque is? It's a long way. Yeah, in the Maya world, that's China. This is the- So people were coming here from all over the Maya world, including Palenque to worship. It's even possible that Pakal was one of them. This is final confirmation that I'm on the right track. Candelaria seems to be the spiritual birthplace of the whole Maya world, and it's not far off. And then Benicio and I see the wheats, the perfect pyramid-shaped limestone mountains Arthur was talking about. There are lots of them. Now we both just want to get to the river, which will take us there.
As soon as we're in our kayaks, we discover another of the amazing features of this landscape Arthur told us about. The whole river gushes out of one hole in the rock. It's astonishing. From here, it's downstream to the Candelaria Caves. But we have one last hurdle to clear. Entrance to the Maya underworld. That led me to explore the stunning subterranean caves and rivers called cenotes, which the Maya believed were the real entrances to the underworld. I understood that there's a parallel between pyramids and mountains. But I had no idea that the caves were so important. And going into Pakal's tomb, I got a sense of this whole building was made just for this cave. And then to find out that the cave was only an access point to the rivers, and then the journey through the cenotes, uh, just the, my whole concept of the Maya religion exploded. The tourist beaches of the Yucatan Peninsula may seem like a strange place to search for the secrets of Pakal's passage to the afterlife. But beneath these beaches are the points where the freshwater cenote system meets the sea. One of them is the cenote they call the Temple of Doom. I'm hoping my guide, Pablo Diaz, and equally famous cave diver, Gonzalo Arcila, can tell me more. I was wondering, I've heard that there are these tubes that go from the cenote bottoms all the way into the sea. Yeah. And I was curious if, one, if there's one around here that we could explore, and two, if I could actually make that journey through the tube. It's not a pretty dive. In Guatemala. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just want to get there and see what it looks like. Wow. The cave is even more spectacular than I imagined. It's all here, the cave and the river in the heart of the mountain. The entrance to Shibalba. This is the river Pakal thought his soul would travel down when he died, leading him towards the Maya afterlife and his rebirth as a god. On Pakal. Alfonso? Hi, I'm Josh. Thank you. What you go, sir? As we climb the 69 steps of Pakal's tomb, Alfonso explains to me that when Pakal built this pyramid, he believed he was building a sacred mountain. He's trying to build a mountain, he said? Mm-hmm. Well, why build a mountain here, though, and there's, and there's a mountain right there? I think he wanted to create his own cave to put his tomb inside. His own cave? The caves are normally a place where you go to the underworld, where you can talk to the gods, and the place where you start your trip to the other world. So there's a cave inside here? Yes, to understand it, we need to go inside and take a look at the tomb. An artificial mountain with a cave in it, an entry to the underworld. Were these somehow the keys to Pakal's pyramid? Oh, wow. like Fortunately, there are hieroglyphs that tell Pakal's story. And when archaeologists finally broke the Maya code, they read of a strange underworld journey that Pakal's spirit would take after his death. It started from a cave in a mountain. And this is it. Yes, this is the most sacred place at Palenque. The entrance to the underworld. So we'll go down to Pakal's tomb. 
Lead the way. Recreated the cave of the Pompol Vu, the cave where the world was born, and they're still worshiping in it today. As we leave the cave, another question occurs to me. Here, and at Palenque, we have a cave in a mountain. In the Yucatan, we have underground rivers. Is there a place where all three exist together, a cave and a river in a mountain? Yeah, the Mayans believe there is a place in the high jungles of Guatemala. We call it Candelaria. It's a real place? Yeah. Really? You've got to take me there. OK, okay. let's go. <laughs> this is turning into an epic adventure, and there's more to come. We're heading for Guatemala's high jungle. My goal is the hidden spiritual birthplace of the Maya world, where I hope to finally discover the secrets of Maya pyramids. But the journey's going to be a wild one. What I've found out so far about Maya pyramids is just amazing. In their pyramids, the Maya were recreating mountains with caves and rivers in them, entrances to the underworld. In Chichicastenango, in the Guatemalan highlands, I finally found out why. The Maya Book of Genesis, the Popol Vuh, tells how the world was born